mic was unmuted. I, that was my bad. We can't blame Bob for that one today. Uh, my, my mic was muted there. So it's so good to see each and every single one of you. Hopefully you're having a, a great weekend. I want to just give you some updates of some things here that have been happening uh, at Cross Creek. So we have started on the bathrooms uh, upstairs right off of our gym. Uh, they began to do the, the framing there in the, in the bathroom. So they are slowly but surely going to be coming along uh, over the next couple of weeks. Uh, there's still an opportunity to be able to give uh, specifically to that project. Um, as I said before, it's going to cost anywhere between twenty twenty-five thousand uh, for us to be able to do those bathrooms. But the reason that we're doing those bathrooms at this time specifically is for us to be able to use our gym in just a, an even greater way than we ever have before. Uh, we need more bathrooms, and uh, for us to be able to use the gym, you gotta you gotta be able to create uh, those facilities there. Uh, so those are in process. Um, for us to be able to uh, be able to have those facilities, and we're just excited uh, for that opportunity to be able to use our gym on even more opportunities, not just here within our church, but also uh, as an opportunity to reach out to our community uh, that is here in Northeast Pennsylvania. Uh, this past week, uh, with our Awana program specifically, we had over a hundred children that were here on a Wednesday night as part of our Awana program. Just incredible. Uh, it's just been awesome to see all the, the different aspects that happened on a Wednesday night from our student ministry to Pastor Dave's Bible study there with Heart to Heart, uh, going through and looking at what is heaven all about and what is heaven like. Um, so just incredible the way, the way that God is moving uh, here in our church. And then last week, I spent some time sharing with you, talking about our mission, the mission of Cross Creek Community Church. Our mission at Cross Creek is to impact our world by multiplying Christ followers who love God and love people. And that's based right out of Scripture. In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus replied in verse 37, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest command. The second is like this, love your neighbor as yourself. And here's what we know by looking at Scripture. You can't love people if you don't love God. God is the one who's created you. He knows you. And if you don't love God, you're not going to love people the way he has called us to love people. And you can't love God if you don't love his creation, if you don't love people. And our mission drives everything. Our mission here at Cross Creek drives every single thing that we do. And you may ask the question, okay, how, do we, how are we as a church going to live out that mission? How are we going to carry out that mission? Over the next several weeks, I'm going to share with you seven core values, seven ways that we as a church are going to love God and love people. And, and, and these are seven core values that to help us to carry out that mission of loving God and loving people. The first core value is a commitment to Scripture. We as a church have to stand upon the truth of God's Word. If we do not, we will fail and we will fall. And you know, and you see, there are many churches across the United States, across the world, that don't have a commitment to Scripture. And as long as I am the pastor here at Cross Creek, I will always make sure that we stand upon God's Word. If you look in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says, For God's Word is alive and active. This, this, this is not a, 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 just a, a book that we come and read. It's a book that's alive and active. It's God's Word. It says it's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of our heart. You've heard me mention that our commitment, our commitment here at Cross Creek to Scripture happens in gatherings like we have here this morning, but also in groups, gatherings and groups, gatherings and life groups. We open up God's Word here on a Sunday morning, but we also open up God's Word in, in life groups. Why? Because 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, it says, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. See, we allow God's Word to bring correction in our lives. And as a church, we stand upon the truth of God's Word. We believe that God's Word is infallible, inerrant, inspired. It's the inspired Word of God. We believe that it, it, it brings teaching. 
It can bring rebuke into our lives. It can bring correction. It can bring training. But we can stand here as a church. I can stand here today and I can say all those fancy words. But the truth is, if we as individuals are not in God's word daily, then we don't have a commitment to scripture. And this, this church, it's not, a, it's not a building. It's not a statement from the, the pulpit. It's not using fancy words. A church is made up of people. And if we, the people of Cross Creek, are not in God's word daily, then we cannot say that we are committed to the truth and we are committed to Scripture. For this reason, today I want to talk about the importance of us as Christians being committed to God's word, allowing Scripture to permeate from our our personal lives, allowing Scripture to impact us, to to change us, to rebuke us, to correct us, to teach us. See, if we are going to be a church that says we are committed to Scripture, then we as believers have to be in God's Word daily. But I know, I know that there's many reasons that Christians don't spend time studying God's Word, reading God's Word. And, and, And I think we easily, if we're not careful, can fall into that trap We can fall into that place where where we struggle to get into God's Word. I mean, most people recognize that, yes, there is a Bible, but yet very few people read Scripture. Did you know that nine out of every ten American households actually own a Bible? The average household in America actually owns four Bibles. But yet, if you you look across America, no no one would say, well, as as an As Americans, we're committed to God's word. Some may even say as Christians in America, are we even committed to God's word? I mean, the Bible is the best-selling book of all time still. And yes, we own Bibles, but just owning a Bible doesn't mean that we believe the Bible. And it doesn't mean that we have a commitment to Scripture. Only two out of every eight American Christians state that they study God's Word regularly. Two out of eight actually spend time finding direction in God's Word for their lives. And I think what happens is we've come to this place where we, have, we say we believe God's Word, but we don't allow it to impact our lives. And what happens is we become vulnerable as Christians to to false teaching. And it leads to spiritual immaturity in our American culture and in our American churches. And I think there's reasons that we quickly come up with as to why we don't read the Bible. We may say, well, I'm too busy. Josh, you're you're a pastor. Like, that's your thing. You're you're, you're supposed to study God's Word. I'm busy. I've got I've got family stuff, I've I've got things with my kids, I've got work, I've got sports, I even have church events. We we may even use that as an excuse. Well, I've I've got church stuff, I've got to prepare, you know, we got kids coming for a while, I I don't have time to, to really truly read God's word. We come to the place where we say, well, I just don't have enough time. Activities, homework, dinner, and maybe you try to read the Bible and you fall asleep. And you come to this place where you say, I really truly want to understand God's word. I want to understand what it says. I believe that we're all so easily distracted. We have the to-do list. We have the things that we need to check off on that list. We have social media that we need to check. There's laundry that needs to be done. We can come up with all kinds of reasons why we would be distracted. And what happens is we come to this place where we're so busy. There was a, a survey of 300 Christians, and 40% said that the biggest obstacle for them in reading God's Word and studying God's Word and what was preventing them from getting in God's Word was distraction. And I think that's because we're in a place now in our culture where we are busier now than ever. I think our phones, I think social media have become a huge factor that, that doesn't allow us to disconnect from culture and allow us to connect with God. See, what we need to do is come to this place where where we actually want to read God's Word. 
I think there's another reason that we don't read it is there's just some that say, I just don't want to do it. I just, I don't want to read God's word, even as Christians. Yes, I, I come to church and I, I do the Sunday thing. I'll even show up every now and then on a Wednesday and, and come to Bible study. John Piper said the reason we don't read the Bible is because we don't want to read the Bible. And I think that in our culture, even as Christians, some have come to this point. And you say, Josh, I, I, I found myself at that point. And you say, I, I don't want to be there. They need to ask God, God, give me a desire. Give me a desire for your word. God, give me a desire to get to know you on a deeper level. Some even say, well, it, it's just hard. It, it's too difficult to read God's word. And I, you just come to this place where you say, well, I, I open up in Genesis and, you know, I just don't understand. Well, yes, at times reading God's word can be difficult to understand. But, you know, you, you don't wake up one morning and say, hey, I'm going to go run a 5K today. No, what do you do? You have to start slowly. And I want to encourage you, start small. Start small. You don't read the Bible at all. Man, I would celebrate if you came to me and said, hey, I read the Bible once this past week. Praise God. You go from once to twice. Start with just five minutes maybe in, in your day of reading God's Word. I think another reason we don't read, the, read God's Word is because we don't make a plan. See, I, I believe that if it's not part of our daily plan, it will not happen. We've got to schedule it. Put it on your calendar and actually try to say, I'm going to carve out time in my life to read God's word. Another reason you may not read God's word is because maybe you're at a place of where you are discouraged. You're discouraged from your past. Maybe there's guilt that's in your life and, and, and you say, I, I've screwed up so many times in my life and, and I go to read God's word and it just brings more conviction, makes me feel even more guilty. Maybe there's anger that's in your life. You're angry towards God because of something that happened in your life. And you say, for me to go and to read his word, it, it just creates more frustration in my life. Maybe even confusion. You open up God's word and there's things you don't understand and it creates confusion. And, and because of that confusion, you, you, you shut the Bible and you say, I, I, just, I just can't do this. Or maybe one of the reasons is you don't know how. I want to help you with that today. Many Christians struggle to pick up their Bible because they don't know how to actually study God's Word. You say, well, what do I do? Do, do I read it, I study God, a commentary, a, a devotional? How much should I read? How long should I read for? Should I like highlight in the Bible? Should I, should I take notes? And yes, all, all those things you can do. The real problem is that people have not made studying God's word a priority in their lives. That's the crux of it. You, you, you can have every excuse under the sun. But the real problem is that we as believers in America, I believe, have not made God's word a priority in our lives. So how do we understand? How do we study scripture? How do we study scripture for ourselves? Well, I think we need to know a couple things about God's word before we even get to the place of studying scripture. We need to understand that God's word is powerful. There is power that is in God's word. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says, For the word of God is alive and powerful. I think that many Christians struggle, and they struggle with a, a lack of confidence. They struggle with knowing who they are in Christ, and because they don't know who they are in Christ, they don't know how to, how to live a life that is connected to the power of Jesus. And they have a hard time overcoming, overcoming the struggles, overcoming the, the, the issues and the things that come up and happen in life. See, there's a benefit for us uh, to read God's word. Psalm chapter 119, verse 11, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So what this passage is telling us is that when we go and we hide God's word in our heart, it helps us not to sin. It helps us not to sin, not just against someone else, but also against God. We have to come to this place where we, not, we don't just read God's word, but we hide God's word in our heart, and we have to make a commitment. Not a statement, but a true commitment that we will be in God's word. In 2009, this is a, an old study, 
but I, I believe that it is still true. The Center for Biblical Engagement did a study of people who studied God's Word. And here's what they found. When a person had a quiet time with God four or more times a week and attended church at least once a month, here's what happened. Feelings of loneliness dropped by 30%. Anger issues dropped by 32%. Relationship problems dropped by 40%. Alcoholism dropped by 57%. Feeling spiritually bored dropped by 60%. Viewing pornography dropped by 61%. And sharing your faith jumped by 200%. You can't tell me that God's Word isn't powerful. God's Word has power. God's Word brings healing. Psalm chapter 107, verse 20, He sent out His Word and healed them. At God's Word, at, at the mouth that Jesus spoke, when Jesus spoke, he, he, we saw, we see in Scripture that, that He healed. He healed people. And throughout Scripture, God is referred to as Jehovah Rapha, meaning healer. He's the one who brings healing to our lives, not just physical healing, but relational healing, emotional healing. And I believe that God's word today can bring healing in your life. But you've got to make spending time in God's word a commitment. God's word brings direction. Psalm chapter 16, verse 9. In their human hearts, they plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. See, we at times in life, we have, we have questions. <clears throat> we may say, well, what's my, what's my purpose? What is it that God's calling me to? How should I work? What kind of job should I have? How, how should I handle this situation? And we come to this place where instead of relying upon God's word and allowing his word to establish our steps, we rely on our own intellect. And we come to this place where we fail got to come back and allow God's word to direct our steps. See, God's word also brings freedom. You're in a place today where, where you feel like you're trapped. You feel like I'm in this place of, of sin, maybe. Maybe you're in a place of a, a relationship. You just don't know what to do. And you say, I, I don't know where to turn. I feel like I'm absolutely trapped. And in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, he says, I has sent me. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. And recover the sight of the blind. And set the oppressed free. That's the words of Christ. That he has come to set us free and to bring us freedom. And bring us to this place where we study God's word. See, God can bring transformation in our lives when we make a commitment to follow him and to study scripture. So you may ask the question, well, how do we study God's word? I believe one of the most important ways that you fall in love with God, that you learn to love God, is by being in his word, knowing that it's important, knowing that, that God's word will change you. You say, well, where do I start? How do I, how do I study God's word? Maybe you say, okay, I'm, I'm going to start studying God's word, and I'm going to begin in Genesis. And you open up to the book of Genesis, and, and, and you start reading and you're like, okay, okay, I, I get this. And by the time you get to Leviticus, you go, what? <laughs> or maybe, maybe this is your method. Maybe you're the type who go, you know, I just, I just don't know which, what direction to go in my life. I don't know which direction to turn. So you do this. Okay. And it happens that you turn to Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 12, which says, very well, he said, I will let you bake your bread over cow dung instead of human excrement. <laughs> For you ladies and men who bake bread, we'll swap recipes later after service. <laughs> I call that the point and shoot method. It doesn't work. So you say, okay, well, how do I study God's word? Start in Genesis, and I get to Leviticus, and by the time I get to Leviticus, I'm discouraged. I open up, I point to a verse, and it's like some crazy verse, and I don't understand that verse. So how do I study God's Word? Let me, let me start by encouraging you with this. Choose a translation that you can understand. Okay, I, I have nothing against King James. If you use King James, great. 
If that works for you, great. But I want to ask you this question that I was asked many years ago as a young pastor. Do you believe in unicorns? I, I put a little picture up last night and I asked the question on social media. Do you believe in unicorns? And, and somebody called Pastor Brian and said, is Josh okay? <laughs> so let me ask you, do you believe in unicorns? Did you know that there's unicorns in the Bible? Numbers chapter 23, verse 22. Eight times in the King James Bible, the word unicorn is said. God, God brought them out of Egypt. He hath as they were the strength as a unicorn. Okay, so, so you, you look at that and you go, okay, Josh, do you believe that unicorns exist? No, I don't. I think that they're using a, a word there. They're using a picture to, to help describe something. And when you go back and you understand the Hebrew and you understand what was written there, is that this was a, a wild, untamed animal. And they were referring to the, the strength of this wild, untamed animal that had a single horn. And most scholars would believe that this animal that they were referring to is very likely a rhinoceros. But for some reason, when King James 1611 was translated, they used the word unicorn. Now, I have nothing against, please understand, the King James Bible. But understand this. Understand that you need a translation that you specifically can understand. Why? And you say, well, Josh, why are there so many different translations? Well, when you look at the original language that the, the scriptures were written in, it was written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And the biblical scholars would translate out of those three, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, translate into what we have as scripture today. And what we know is that language changes over time. So different translations use different words, which have similar meanings. But sometimes it can create confusion. If you have a Bible that you read and you say, I just don't understand it, find a translation that you can understand. Uh, here, here's what I use. I use NIV, I use ESV, I use New Living Translation, and New King James. And here, here's what I'll do. I'll read a verse in ESV, I'll then go and look at that verse in NIV, I'll then go and look at that verse in the NLT, which is the New Living Translation, and then I'll go and look at that verse in the New King James. NIV and NLT are the most common language, uh, for the, the, you could say, for common people. And personally, I like studying the ESV version of Scripture. Uh, find a translation that works for you. Find a translation that you can understand. But then second, choose a time and a place to study God's Word. Choose a time and a place to study God's Word. Have a consistent time. No matter where, no matter when, find a time and a place and be consistent with it. You like mornings? You're a morning person? I'll pray for you. <laughs> get up and get in God's word and start your day. Start your day reading God's word. Align your heart with, with his steps. Align your heart with the direction that, that he's calling you to. Find a place, your, your favorite chair, a, a kitchen table, maybe even a, a closet. But have a plan. Get your Bible, get maybe a, a devotional book, and go through specifically that book and allow God to speak to you. But you also have to understand the context that Scripture is written in. Many verses are often taken out of context. I've had people over the years of me being a pastor who have come to me and said, hey, God will never give you more than you can handle. How many of you ever heard somebody say that? Okay, you know it's not in the Bible. Here's what they do. They take this passage out of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, and they don't understand the context. They don't understand what, what Scripture is saying. In verse 13, it says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. And God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. This passage is talking about temptation. That God is not the one who, who brings temptation into our lives. But well-meaning Christians, they take that and they go, well, God will never give you more than you can handle. I actually believe the opposite. 
I believe that there are times where God will give you more than you can handle so that you rely upon him. And so that you look to him. See, we've got to understand the context. Context matters more than you realize. The Bible is a collection of 66 books written in three languages across three continents over a period of time of 1,500 years. 40 different authors, shepherds, farmers, tent makers, doctors, fishermen, priests, kings. It's a collection of of poems and letters and laws. And see, it's written by so many different people, so that we all have the opportunity to relate and connect to God's Word. So how do you understand context? Well, here's what you do. You ask yourself these three questions. Who wrote it? Who wrote it? Who was it written to? And what is the purpose of this particular passage of Scripture? I want you to turn with me to Philemon. If you have your Bibles, turn to Philemon chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear brother and fellow worker, to the church that meets in your house. Now, you read that, and you go, okay, I want to study this passage. I want to understand this passage. So we begin to ask ourselves the question, well, who's it written to? Who has written it, and what's the purpose? And what we need to do is sometimes go outside of Scripture to read commentaries, to read studies. If you have the, the Version Bible app, I think that's a great resource. Study Bible is a great resource. Commentaries are a great resource. I, I would also encourage you, and write this down, blueletterbible.com. I've used blueletterbible.com for years to help me to understand Scripture, and I have never found anything that is... Uh, off kilter that would not line up with what we believe is in God's word. But we have to understand the context. So, so how do we understand the context of Philemon chapter 1, verses 1 through 2? Well, we see that, that Paul was writing this book, and we know that Paul was writing it while he was in prison. He's writing it to a wealthy man named Philemon who led a church, he had a house church, that, that was in his home. And he's writing this passage, he's writing it about a runaway slave, a slave that was owned by Philemon. And that slave met Paul in Rome, and Paul led that slave to Christ. So Paul's purpose for writing this letter was to encourage Philemon to forgive that slave and accept Philemon as a brother in Christ. Well now, now that we understand that, That leads us more to an understanding of what's being written in this passage. If you look with me in verse 4, here's what Paul says. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love for all the holy people and the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because of you, brother, having refreshed the heart of the Lord's people. Now, here's what Paul's doing. Paul is either being very sincere to this gentleman or Paul is trying to butter him up. Because what he's dealing with is a big situation. He's dealing with a, a big problem of a, a slave that Philemon owned who ran away. Now, that slave, they could be beheaded, they could have been beaten, they could have been killed. So what Paul is doing is Paul is encouraging Philemon to forgive this slave and treat this slave as an equal. So then we come to the place in our lives. Is there anybody in my life that I need to forgive? Is there anybody in in my life that I, I need to treat in a better manner? See, what we have to do is come to this place where we when we better understand the context of the verse, it brings the verse to life. It brings the verse alive. You want to say, I, you say to me, I, I, want to, I want to understand a little bit more of what it means to, to study God's word, to understand the context of God's word. I'm going to leave this up here on the stage after service. This is a book. It's 30 days, of course it's a book as I hold it up. Hey, it's a book. 30 days to understanding the Bible, unlocking the scriptures in 15 minutes a day. I'll leave it up here on the stage. I would encourage you, buy this on Amazon. I think it's like 12 bucks. 
You can't afford 12 bucks, tell me. I'll buy it for you personally. I believe that you have to understand the context of God's word for it to be alive, for it to be active, for you to really truly grasp a hold of what scripture is saying. So you understand God's word by coming to the place of saying that, that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take time. I'm going to take time. I'm going to choose the right translation. I'm going to choose a, a time and a place. I'm going to take the step to understand the context. And as you're in and you're reading God's word, number four, you read slowly and ask questions. Read slowly and ask questions. Here's two questions that you can ask when you read God's word. What does this say about God? So as you read that passage in Philemon, ask yourself the question, what does this say about God? And then you can ask yourself the question, what does this say about me? What is God trying to speak to me? There's also another way of, of studying God's word. And I didn't come up with this, but it, it's called the spec method. And it's asking yourselves this question after you read a passage of scripture. You say, is there a sin in that passage that I should avoid? Is there a promise from God that I need to claim? Is there an example that I need to follow? Is there a command that he's calling me to obey? And is there something to know specifically about God? So when you get into God's word, when you're reading, read, maybe read a, a passage, four or five, six verses. And then sit and ask yourself these questions. Is there a sin that I need to avoid? Is there something, a promise that I need to proclaim? Is there an example to follow? Is there a command to obey? And is there something that I need to know specifically about God? And as you read that passage and you take time studying God's word, you pray. And you ask God to speak to you. Ask him to reveal to you how you should apply what you are reading in that passage. Ask him to open up your eyes. And as you read God's word, as I read God's word, what I do is I pray, God, is there something you want me to see in this passage? Is there something that, that you want to say to me specifically? Is there something that, God, you're trying to show me? See, instead of us coming to this place of always asking God why, we come to this place where we need to ask God what. We need to ask God what. See, God's word is alive. It's active and it's powerful. You sit here today and, and you say, Josh, this is, this is great information, but I've been doing this for years. Great. Now come alongside of someone else. Somebody who's maybe a young believer and help them to understand God's word. Help them to understand what it means when, when God speaks and, and, and that God's word is, an, is alive and active. See, we've, we've got to come to this place where we allow God's word to speak to us. We allow God's word to guide us. We allow God's word to protect us. We allow God's word to empower us. And we allow God's word to guide us and guard us from temptation. We allow it daily to, as scripture says, to renew our minds. And we build our faith upon God's word, the truth of his word. So let's not just say that, yeah, we're, we're a church that's committed to Scripture. But let's actually be a church that is committed to God's Word. And that we follow, we follow what He tells us to do. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You. We thank You for loving us. Father, we thank You for the forgiveness that we can experience in Jesus. Father, help us to run to you daily and repent of our sins, turn from our sins, and seek you. God, help us to not just stand here from the pulpit and say that we are committed to Scripture, but God, help us as a church, we as Cross Creek Community Church, God, help us to truly be committed to Scripture daily, the truth of your word. God, I thank you. I thank you for guiding us, for leading us. God, help us never to waver from Scripture. God, help us to seek you and to follow you. In Jesus' name we pray.